There is simply an urgency to rush arms into a conflict where civilians are dying en masse. And that is what I don't understand. To get to negotiations requires trust and it requires leadership. Both are lacking right now, uh, on both sides, frankly. What we're ultimately talking about is the right of civilians, whether they be Palestinian or Israeli, to live in peace, to feel secure in their homes, secure from rocket attacks, and secure from F-16 drop precision guided munitions. Coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. We cannot be both against occupation and for it. We cannot be both for freedom and against it. And we cannot be for a better world while contributing to one that is materially worse. So wrote today's guest in his letter of resignation from the U.S. State Department on October 18th. Josh Paul had served 11 years in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which is the U.S. government entity most responsible for the transfer and provision of arms to partners and allies. He always knew, he wrote, that his job would be morally complex. But he made himself a promise, he said, that he would only stay as long as he felt he could do more good than harm. And this month, he reached that point. Quote, I am leaving today because I believe that in our current course with regard to the continued, indeed expanded and expedited provision of lethal arms to Israel, I have reached the end of that bargain. Josh Paul joins me now. As Palestinian deaths from the Israeli bombardment of Gaza top 5,000 and just a few of the roughly 200 or so Israelis taken hostage by Hamas October 7th have been released. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, is among many who are demanding immediate Gaza ceasefire. And protests continue around the world. Josh Paul previously worked on security sector reform in both Iraq and the West Bank with additional roles in the office of the Secretary of Defense, U.S. Army staff, and as a congressional staffer. He grew up between London and New York and holds master's degrees from the universities of Georgetown and St. Andrews in Scotland. I'm very honored to have Josh Paul on the program. Thank you so much for joining me. No, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this important issue. Talk for just one minute about why you decided to go into the field that you did. When you talk about that more good than harm, um, what did you set out? What have you all these years set out to do? So it has been a learning experience, I'll be very honest. Uh, I really entered the international security field uh, in the wake of September 11th, as, as many Americans did, uh, and particularly after the invasion of Iraq, where I was a, a young uh, worker in D.C., uh, honestly, uh, looking for something different and a bit of excitement uh, and managed to get a job with the Coalition Provisional Authority in Baghdad um, and did not go into that as as the ideologue I think that I am now. Um, but it was a, a deep learning experience uh, through my time working with the Iraqi security forces uh, and seeing and understanding what American foreign policy can look like on the ground, uh, both the good and uh, the very ugly. And ever since that experience, uh, I have been very focused on integrating human rights uh, into my work, uh, both within and outside of the U.S. government. What was it about this point? Um, we're looking at the last 11 years of, if we're just going to talk about Israel-Palestine, 2009, 2014, 2,200 Palestinians dead in three weeks. Was it something qualitatively different about this moment or just quantitatively or, or, or what? Uh, both, actually. Um, quantitatively, yes. I think the outbreak of violence we are seeing uh, between uh, in Gaza between Israel and Hamas um, is fundamentally different than that which we've seen. It is of a scale uh, that we have not seen previously. Uh, and to be clear, that is down to Hamas in the first instance uh, for its initial barbaric attack uh, on Israeli civilians. Um, but the scale of Israel's response as such as well has also been to date quantitatively different than we have seen. It is also qualitatively different. I have been involved in a large number of, of deeply challenging, morally complex uh, policy making decisions on arms transfers. Uh, the difference is that those have always had the chance to be debated, discussed, uh, delayed, uh, mitigated. Uh, and even when you knew that there wasn't necessarily an outcome that you supported, there was at least the confidence that you were handing over the case to Congress, because major arms sales require notification to Congress, 
where there could be further debate and discussion uh, and efforts even to prevent such sales. In this instance, there is no such debate. There is simply an urgency to rush arms into uh, a conflict where civilians are dying en masse. Uh, and that is what I don't understand. That is what I could not do anything to stop. Uh, and the lack of abs or the lack of space in the administration and in Congress to have this discussion is why I thought that the only place to have it would be in the public eye. Can you talk about what rules and guidelines and regulations currently govern U.S. arms sales to Israel and other countries like it? Sure. So the fundamental laws are the Arms Export Control Act of 1976 and the Foreign Assistance Act uh, of 1966, uh, 1968. And uh, those provide uh, the fundamental basics on how and when arms should be transferred, uh, including uh, a legal caveat uh, that arms may only be provided for certain purposes, uh, such as uh, defense and joint operations, and legitimate defense, and that um, they should only be used for the purpose for which they were provided. Um, and as an aside, I think we can all agree uh, that human rights violations and massive civilian casualties are not a reason uh, for which US arms are ever provided. Uh, on top of the law, uh, every administration since the Reagan administration has issued a conventional arms transfer policy. This is the policy that shapes the thinking that is supposed to, and the analysis that is supposed to go into each of these decisions uh, on a case-by-case -case basis about arms transfers as they move forward. The Biden administration's conventional arms transfer policy, to its credit, uh, raised the bar to the highest level it has ever been uh, for arms transfers with something called the uh, more likely than not standard. Um, it says that an arms transfer will not be authorized if it is more likely than not that the arms in question uh, will be used to commit uh, human rights violations of, of various types. And I think it is more than apparent uh, that arms that we are providing to Israel, particularly precision guided munitions uh, for the conflict in Gaza, uh, will be used. It is more likely than not, uh, in fact, it is a near certainty uh, that they will be used for human rights violations and result in massive civilian casualties. You told PBS recently that this wasn't the first time concerns, and even you have raised concerns, about units within the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. Every other country, uh, if there is grant U.S. military assistance going to a unit, that unit is vetted before it receives the assistance. Uh, in the case of Israel, we provide the assistance and then look out for reports of violations. And if there are reports of violations, uh, those are brought up within a policy process within the State Department. Uh, there is consultation with Israel on its version of events. Uh, and then theoretically, a determination is made on whether a gross violation of human rights has occurred. Uh, to date, through what this is through this process, which is called the Israel Leahy vetting process, uh, there has never been a determination that Israel has committed a gross violation of human rights. Um, so I think that is obviously problematic when one looks at uh, not necessarily even just Gaza, uh, but the West Bank, where there are frequent reports of extrajudicial killings uh, and of uh, other abuses by uh, Israeli security forces. You mentioned a few of them in your letter, and in fact, in your your letter, you you make the fairly brave comparison between settler behavior and the Israeli juvenile detention system, unique in the world, and the actions of Hamas. Are you saying the settlers yes. are terrorists? I think certain settlers who attack civilians uh, with the intent of causing of using violence for political means, I mean, the use of violence for political purposes is the definition of terrorism. There is widespread agreement that you, that violations have happened in the past before we even get to this conflict. And you made the point very clearly that the Biden administration specifically sure has established stronger guidelines on weapons transfers than the governments that preceded it. That being the case, how do you explain what's happening right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to uh, there is, uh, you know, just a, an unwillingness to criticize Israel. Um, it's a it's a unique case, a special case. Um, you know, there are many reasons for that, uh, some of them legitimate. Um, but what it means at the end of the day is I think if you don't have uh, a, a global standard, you don't have a standard. Well, you also have Matt Miller, State Department spokesperson saying, we never violate any laws. Uh, we, uh, uh, we comply with all applicable 
Congress, uh, statutory requirements and regulatory requirements in our provision of military assistance to Israel as we do to every other country in the world. So I think Matt Miller might actually be technically correct in some ways. Uh, many of these laws uh, require the department to come to some sort of a determination uh, before any sanctions or withholding of assistance occurs. Uh, if you never come to the determination, you've never broken the law. Uh, that said, I believe that the legal standards are rather lapsed, lacked and uh, lacking. Uh, and I believe that we should be holding ourselves to a stronger standard. Uh, part of this also comes down to questions of interpretation of law. You also said that it is in the hands of higher ups. The main policy decisions on Israel right now are being made uh, from the top down, uh, which again is atypical. For most arms sales, they sort of bubble their way up uh, from the bottom. You get an application from a partner or from a US company uh, seeking a certain military capability. Uh, and that's a debate that, you know, gradually bubbles up to the decision makers. Uh, in this instance, the decision was made, uh, and therefore there was no space for that that bubbling, for that debate. At the top is the president. Is he ultimately responsible? Of course, these are his authorities. Do we have a moment now with President Biden coming out right after you resigned, actually, um, urging Congress to approve, I think, more than $100 billion in aid for Israel, Ukraine, and I think Taiwan. Um, is there a moment now, especially to stop any of that? Or is it going to go no matter what? I think it's an important moment to talk about it because it highlights it, right? And the debate inevitably will go away. In a several months, this won't be something that is on the top of everyone's minds. And while it is, I think this is the opportunity to make an impression. Is it going to change anything in the short term? That I can't say. I think we have seen a, a slight shift over the last uh, few days uh, in the administration's approach. Uh, I think we've seen a change in tone, a greater focus on Palestinian civilian casualties and the harm that it could be done. Um, but in terms of the actions that underlie that, uh, when we look at a supplemental request that has billions of dollars for arms and $100 million dollars uh, for humanitarian relief in Gaza, for example, uh, I, I think I'm skeptical that the short term will make any difference. But I think the long term is much more promising. You talked about the harm that could be done. And even as we speak, people are being killed. Um, as we record this, um, Raji Sarani, the director of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in Gaza, spoke on Democracy Now! and basically said Palestinian civilians are in the eyes of the storm. They are the targets. They, they destroyed the Gaza. I, I mean, it's unbelievable. This army targeting only civilians and civilian targets, towers, houses, hospitals, churches, mosques, schools, shelter places, ambulances, nurses, doctors, journalists, this is the most ethical army. This is the most ethical army in the world. This is the mighty Israel. It's might and power targeting civilians. They are doing war crimes, crimes against humanity, persecution for 2.4 million people for the last 18 days. This is a moment of despair and fury. And I wonder, um, holding all of the civilian victims in our hearts at the same time, I certainly um, feel and weep for those whose families have been torn apart by the attacks of Hamas, whose relatives are held hostage still. But with all of that in your heart right now, how do you make sense of your effort and those of your colleagues? to try to insert human rights kind of rules on war? Because it almost seems inevitable that in the name of right to defense, right to reprisal, um, governments do whatever the heck they like. So, I mean, there are laws of war. They're not always necessarily enforceable. And of course, uh, the US has prevented the Palestinians uh, from seeking re re restorative justice uh, or justice of any kind through the International Criminal Court. Um, so I, I think it's important to note that, that there are laws that apply, there are rules of conduct, and there are basic standards of human decency that apply. Uh, I think at the end of the day, as you said, what we're talking about here is not, does not boil down, should not boil down 
uh, to Israel, right or wrong. What we're ultimately talking about is the right of civilians, whether they be Palestinian or Israeli, uh, to live in peace, uh, to feel secure in their homes, uh, secure from rocket attacks and secure from F-16 drop precision guided munitions. Uh, and I hope that this administration uh, can take a look at our own historic policies, uh, both uh, in Israel and drawing from our experience in the region, not all of which is positive by any means, um, and and push Israel and push all the parties uh, towards a solution that is more just and that provides the peace that people who just want to live their everyday lives and raise their families deserve. Like what? What would that solution look like? What would you propose right now if you still had your job inside the State Department? So I think there are two streams there. One is with regards to the transfer of arms to Israel right now, which is, of course, what I was most directly involved in and what I retired over or resigned over. Um, and with regards to that, again, I would, I would ask the Biden administration to follow its own laws, uh, its own policies that it has set, and just to simply apply the same standard and the same space for debate to Israel as it has permitted uh, or encouraged uh, for, for conflicts and for partners uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, beyond that, I think we need a radical re-envisioning of what the Middle East peace process looks like. Uh, I think it has broken down. Uh, I do not think, having served in Ramallah, uh, that the two-state solution is viable. One need only look at the settlement, uh, entrenched settlements and network of infrastructure supporting them uh, to, to understand that there is no way for a Palestinian state, as conceived in Oslo, uh, to exist in that context. Uh, so is the answer to... Uh, take apart, dismantle the settlements. Uh, I don't know how politically feasible that is in Israel, uh, particularly if we look at the coalition that's in government now. Uh, and if that's not, then what is the answer? And what are we pushing for? And what is the lesson of the last few decades? I think the policy approach from the US has been security for peace, uh, that if Israel feels secure, uh, it will feel comfortable making the concessions necessary uh, to allow peace. Uh, but what we've seen instead is the more secure Israel feels, the more it has pushed the envelope, the more settlements have expanded, uh, the more uh, civil rights have been taken away from Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, the more the siege of Gaza has continued. Uh, and so I think we need to step away from that way of thinking and, and ask if maybe instead of security for peace, uh, there's some way of peace for security. We need to stop the violence now. Vengeance is not a strategy. We need to negotiate and we need to get the captives out. That's what I'm saying. I call on, on everybody, on the Israeli government, on Hamas, and Canada, everybody to put pressure on both sides to negotiate and to, to get the captives out. My community is wiped out. It's it's incomprehensible, it's just, and it was very vicious, viciously done. But um, that's the point, that's the point. The only way to be safe is to have peace. You see some people anyway referred to as peace activists in Israel, I've actually heard quite a few of them who um, have referred to their lost relatives, people being held hostage as peace activists um, against more suffering in their name inside Israel. Um, are there negotiating partners there for the kind of peace you're talking about? I think there are negotiating partners on both sides. I think everyone at the end of the day, even even those who who are, you know, on the extremes of both sides, ultimately everyone wants peace, right? Uh, I, I think that to get to negotiations requires trust and it requires leadership. Uh, and I think both are lacking right now uh, on both sides, frankly. What are the implications globally? I think America faces a real challenge. There is a global competition for influence that is playing out from Latin America uh, to the Middle East. Uh, I think the United States uh, edge in this competition and certainly our, our most valuable tool uh, is our values. Um, that is what sets us apart from authoritarian regimes around the world, uh, including those who we are competing against. Uh, if we are seen to apply those values uh, differently uh, for different partners, uh, if we are seen to be hypocritical, uh, whether it is by standing against uh, occupation in Ukraine, but for it uh, in Israel, 
uh, or if we are seen to be pushing against civilian casualties and decrying the harm that is caused by them in some contexts, uh, but turning a blind eye or even facilitating them in another, I think that does irreparable harm uh, to the broader uh, US interest, which I actually believe is a global interest, uh, that the values that we espouse and I hope believe in uh, are the ones that ultimately shape the future of the world. You also at the beginning said that your views have evolved since your time in Iraq and your time living in Ramallah. Can you just talk about how? When you are living amongst a community, uh, which was certainly more the case in Ramallah than in Iraq, you hear different perspectives, uh, you are exposed to different cultures, and, and you live the life. And I think, you know, particularly in the West Bank, uh, when you see the life the Palestinians have, uh, the humiliation, the constant humiliation at checkpoints, um, the constant, uh, you know, uh, incursions uh, by Israeli military forces, uh, you, you come to understand different perspectives, uh, and that's just a function of, of living overseas. I think as well, uh, having worked for the US government, uh, the United States has an immense amount of power uh, around the world and an immense amount of uh, influence uh, and presence. And that comes with an immense amount of responsibility, and you feel that. Uh, you are challenged working for the US government, I think with, with questions and problems that you would not be working for many other governments, uh, not because we are uh, better or worse, um, but because we are more involved in so many of these complex questions. So what can be done? I'm sure there are people in our audience who, whatever, wherever they stand on culpability for this particular round of, of violence, want to see an end to it and want to see peace. What can they do right now to perhaps to support civil service like the ones you're hearing from who are saying, we're still deciding to be inside trying to do good. Are there things civil society outside can do to support people like that? Yeah, there are three things I'll point to. The first is a bit of a cliche, but it really does matter. Uh, contact your member of Congress, contact your senator. Uh, I worked in a congressional office and I know how we used to sit down uh, with the member of Congress on a weekly basis review the call logs and go through them and say, okay, we've had five calls on this side, we've had seven calls on that side. And that really does inform how members of Congress think about their votes. Uh, so that, that really is an important thing to do. The second thing is I would say, reach out to your local media. Uh, there are reporters for what's left anyway of local media uh, who cover um, local communities and how they are reacting to world events. Uh, make sure they're getting your side of the story. Uh, and the third thing, of course, is is organize. And there are some good organizations already out there. Uh, so, that, that are, so for example, there's the Alliance for Peacebuilding uh, is, is one organization uh, who does a lot of good work bringing communities together around both local conflict resolution and global conflict issues. So I think those are the three things I would recommend. Do you have a message for people still working in the administration and your in the jobs, the desks that were next to yours before you left? Sure. I, I mean, I think... You know, um, I think everyone does what they can based on the circumstances they live in. I, I would say to them that you have a unique opportunity to do good. And as I discovered, it's possible to do more good in one day uh, within certainly the State Department uh, and, and around the U.S. government than many people can hope to achieve in a lifetime. Use that opportunity. Uh, I, I think you're in a place of, of immense responsibility and the opportunity to speak up uh, you don't have to win every fight. You don't have to fight every fight. Um, but you are in a place where you can really make a difference. And I hope you do. This wasn't just any other fight. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh Paul. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a truism to say that what we measure, we tend to treasure, and we sure can measure U.S. military spending year after year. In 2023, that number stood at almost 800 hundred billion dollars. And researchers at Brown University calculate we've spent some eight trillion dollars on war since 9-11 alone. Has all of that spending made the world a safer, more peaceful place? Or has it simply ratcheted up a global war economy? Unfortunately, as the people of Israel discovered after the horrific terror attacks by Hamas on October 7th, 
Force alone cannot be relied upon to keep a people safe against an enemy with a grievance that has boiled over into war. So how about it? How about we invest as much in war prevention and in conflict resolution as we invest in our war economy? It is at least worth a try. How about departments of peace at every level, national, local, regional? Could we embed our local economies as effectively in making peace and resolving conflict as we have embroiled them in making tools for war? I believe we can. And Josh Paul, in our extended conversation, says that the lesson from the Northern Irish peace process is that focus is required. You can find my full unedited conversation with Josh Paul through a subscription to our podcast. In the meantime, stay kind, stay curious, and thanks for joining me. For The Laura Flanders Show, I'm Laura. Till the next time. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org. 